you should get a, a uh, pop-up as well on your end. So um, we're all here for a workshop on crosswalks with census data using R. Um, and I hope that some of you have also taken advantage of the other uh, sessions that have been presented by Geo Health Network as part of this series, but I know that the materials and recordings will be made available on our website uh, as well. So hopefully that can continue to be a resource to some of you in the future. Um, we did introductions already, and I wanted to just start with a case study. You'll have to forgive the resolution on these files, but this is actually a, a couple of maps that I made many years ago now as part of my master's uh, research project, um, which are showing premature mortality in Ontario's LINs. So LINs are now a defunct uh, unit of health geography in Ontario. They used to be the local health integration networks, and they have since been replaced by the Ontario Health no Networks, on, or OHTs. But um, this report, or the report that this figure comes from, um, was about understanding geographic variation in premature mortality uh, at the Lynn level in Ontario because um, Lynn's were at the time a, a very relevant unit for um, health system decision making. And the reason that I'm including this as a sort of starting point is because it was the first crosswalk that I ever used. Um, we specifically had uh, a crosswalk linking census geography I, um, that was based on uh, output from postal conversion file plus uh, and used the crosswalk to convert or aggregate uh, mortality data to the LIN level to create these maps. And as you can see, we found extreme variation in, in premature mortality risk across the province um, at the LIN level. But one question that I want to maybe pose to the group or key you to think about is what these maps may have looked like if we had been working with a different spatial um, unit of analysis. So if the crosswalk that I had used pointed to some, some other unit, uh, then the pattern we may have seen could have been quite different. And you can imagine, um, for those of you that are familiar with Ontario, some thoughts about what that might have, how that may have looked different, or for those of you that are not, but are familiar with sort of aggregate mapping in general, it's often something we see that um, patterns look very different depending on the level or, or zoning scale that you use uh, to map them. So this sort of brings me to this question of why are we here? I think that um, this is a problem that many of you might be familiar with. Problem might not be the right word, but a, but a use case, I guess, which is that a lot of the times health data end users are interested in spatial data uh, or presenting data spatially, but not, not technically proficient in spatial analysis or necessarily um, well versed in the different, let's say, geographic frames that are available. And so what ends up happening is data, both publicly available data, but also data that you um, gain access to in the course of your work can be spatially resolved at contradictory scales. You can have access to a data source that is resolved at one level and an end user or collaborator or um, knowledge user who's interested in seeing those data um, visualized or represented or analyzed at a totally different scale. And so we need to have a skill set in how to harmonize data um, across multiple spatial scales. And by spatial scale, I mean both small to large, but also zoning schemes. So like different sets of boundaries that may be roughly the same size. 
And so I have found in my work, both in academia, I'm doing my PhD right now at McGill, but also in, um, in um, population health outside of academia, um, that understanding how to manage and visualize data uh, across these spatial scales is a very useful skill and importantly for probably some of you also a very valuable skill. Um, it's been a key resource in sort of my health geography work, I would say. So before I jump into the uh, piece, basically, um, I want to start with some housekeeping. One is my assumptions. So I want to make sure that we're all at the same place. I am assuming that you have access to the files to this workshop, that you've downloaded them, and that you've unzipped them on your computer, and that you've installed R. If you haven't done those things, I would suggest that you start it now so that it that's all set up by the time we get to the coding exercise. Um, I want to just give you a, a heads up that I'm going to be aiming for a 10 minute break every 50 minutes, so like 50 minutes on, 10 minutes off. Um, it, but it'll be like a bit of a rough, a rough go at that. And I'm also aiming to have a bit of a longer break between coding sections one and two. So there's two sections of the exercise. And I think what I'm planning on doing is running through sort of my the code on my end and then letting you have some time to work on it on your end and catch up if your computer's a bit slow or whatever have you and during that period it'll be a break but i'll be very much online and and um, attending to any questions that you have and i'm going to try and um uh give pauses sort of along the way as well uh to make sure that you are all keeping up or keeping track um but, but I would really just encourage you to interrupt me at any point. You can unmute yourself. I'm um, going to do my best to keep an eye on the chat, but I'm not, um, it's not like open necessarily on my computer. So I would just say if somebody else, I know there are people, a couple of people who can't uh, speak because of their environment um, or microphone setup. If some, if you see a message in the chat that I seem to be missing somebody else, uh, if somebody else could find me, that would be very much appreciated. Um, and then I'll say this again at the end, but I would just encourage you to keep in touch after the session. If you know, as you begin to work through some of these in the course of your own work, I'm happy to stay available to you via email um, and my emails there. So with all that being said, um, I want to just tell you what the setup uh, of today's session is going to be. So I do have a relatively brief introduction and background. I think nobody really wants to hear me talking at you, especially on a Friday afternoon uh, for very long. But I think that it is important to get us all to the same level in terms of some key pieces of background context. And it'll also set up the actual exercise that we're doing for the workshop. And then, as I said, there's sort of two um, coding pieces. One is the developing of the crosswalk. So we will be making a crosswalk in R um, to correspond FSA or forward sortation area geography with public health unit or PHU geography in Ontario. Um, and then the third, the second code coding exercise is applying the crosswalk, so using the crosswalk they're making in the first part to summarize some data that I have downloaded from the census for you, and then a visualization exercise as well for those census data at the public health unit level again in Ontario, and then a very brief uh, wrap up. Okay. Um, I'll just pause if, in case there are any questions sort of before I begin. And yes, uh, sorry, I'm seeing in, in the chat, Alec is asking if the slides will be available for download. They are available. They're already in the zip files that, that you downloaded, as Michael said. And um, e you can get in contact with either GeoHealth Network or myself if you have any issues with accessing those files after the session. Okay, great. 
So let's talk about background. So um, you all know that you're here for a census uh, based session. I think it, it, it is assumed, but I want to be explicit that we're talking about Canadian uh, data, Canadian census, and that's been true of the, all the, the workshops. So in the context of Canada, census geography uh, refers to geographic areas that are used by Statistics Canada for the collection and reporting of census data. So this map on the right hand side is showing um, census divisions across the country, which is a rather large unit of census geography, um, but they have quite a range in size, I would guess. Um, a couple points that I think are useful for you to know, one is that StatCan maintains a lot of spatial data products representing these geographies. I'm talking about maps, but I'm also talking about um, shape files, correspondence files, and user guides. Those are all very useful for um, visualizing data and then also for sort of having the necessary documentation to support um, whatever your spatial and analytic goals are. And I think the thing that I have found important about census geographies, which is a set of geographies that I come back to over and over and over again in the course of my work in, in Canada, is that um, census geographies are important because they're the only units that we have comprehensive population data for. The census, um, as many of you will be very familiar with, is the only survey in Canada that captures the entire population or is intended to capture the entire population, which means we have really rich data um, about the population. And that means that we can also summarize uh, sort of important population subgroups using census data to an extent that is very hard to capture with other uh, survey data sources, no matter how large they, they kind of get. Um, so, in my experience, it can be very important to understand how census boundaries and data align with whatever study or reference population you're using in the course of your work. This is a figure showing the hierarchy of census geographies. Um, it's available online and I think that would be useful for some of you to refer back to it at, at various points. but just some things to point out, and this is really for orienting to the workshop exercise. One is that the, the census geographies in Canada follow a hierarchy. Um, so some statistical areas are nested into other statistical areas. What that means is that dissemination areas, which is the smallest statistical area that, that Statistics Canada releases census data for, it's like the census profile, the smallest resolution is the dissemination area. The DAs nest into census tracts, meaning that like they're like building blocks that form the C the census tract and census census subdivision borders if you follow it up this way. And that means that the borders in these like nested hierarchies respect the borders of the lower geography. So you'll never you'll essentially never have a conflict, like a boundary conflict if you're working within a nested geography. That doesn't mean that in the nested hierarchy, all of the geographies have comprehensive coverage or cover all of Canada. So for example, census tracts, even though they're nested above DAs, don't cover all of Canada. They only exist in um, census, in tracted census metropolitan areas. And then outside of the nesting, so these, these are nested, they're like stacked, but, but there are also census geographies that exist outside of this nested hierarchy. So for example, one, one that we're working with today, which is the forward sortation area, is a geographic unit defined by the first three digits of the postal code. And forward sortation areas, as you can tell by this hierarchy, don't respect the boundaries of any of the other census geographies. So um, there are boundary conflicts or issues when you're trying to correspond 
these statistical areas with um, admi some administrative areas such as FSAs. So lots of complexity going on even within census geographies because all the ones we've talked about are still technically um, census geographies. Statistics Canada does release FSA level census profiles. Um, but then even on top of that, it's very common for data end users to be interested in geographies that are not captured by census data. And for the purpose, of, I'm considering these to be non-census geographies. This comes up in my experience. So this map here is showing um, Toronto, the Toronto neighborhoods. It's a map of, of primary care essentially in Toronto neighborhoods. Toronto neighborhoods are an example of non-census geography. And I show it to say that I think in my experience, the reason that non-census geographies become, tend to come up is because uh, they're sort of regionally or locally important. So provincial subregions, urban neighborhoods might be defined at a municipal or provincial level. So they're not, um, not nationally relevant. And so they don't exist within the sort of census geography s schema. But some of them, for example, the Toronto neighborhoods do respect census geography boundaries. So, so Toronto neighborhoods are actually made up of um, DAs. The second point on the slide is that um, reporting on non-census geographies sometimes does require integration of census data. So we still need to understand census data at that scale. This, in my experience, comes up quite a lot when subpopulations are not enumerated. So we don't have necessarily a population denominator for a given provincial subregion because there's no survey that goes out and counts those people using that geographic definition. So we need to integrate census data in order to construct a meaningful population denominator. That's just one use case, but there are many cases where it's useful to, to be able to represent census data at a, a non-census geographic level. And this is where a crosswalk comes in. So now we're getting to sort of, again, the why are we here question. As I said um, earlier, harmonizing data between census and non-census geographies ref often requires uh, some sort, sort of spatial analytic approach. This often, but definitely not always, can happen in the form of a crosswalk. What do I mean by crosswalk? Um, so a crosswalk is essentially just a file, usually a flat file uh, table, for example, Excel spreadsheet, CSV, that describes the correspondence between two or more sets of geographic boundaries and enables the harmonization of data across those um, geographic boundaries. So this is an example of what that might look like, obviously a trivial example, but this is a list of subregions, Lynn subregions in Ontario, and how they map to the Lynns um, in Ontario. So Brant belongs to Hamilton, Niagara, Haldo, and Brant, so on and so forth. This obviously doesn't list all of the subregions, but you could imagine a file of this format could be used to take data that's, that's captured at a subregion level and enable you to aggregate it to the LIN level if that is the unit level at which you're interested in representing or um, analyzing those data. And then I do just need to do my spatial epidemiologist due diligence and flag two problems that come up whenever you're using a crosswalk. Whenever you're aggregating data spatially, you need to think about the modifiable aerial unit problem, which is something that I'm sure many, many of you have come across before. This is essentially the situation that occurs when data are aggregated at different spatial scales or with different zoning schemes. And all this means is that if you modify the aerial unit that you're working with, if you modify the spatial scale or the zoning scheme, you can result in different statistical findings and study results. 
And so just because you have a certain set of findings or a result at one level um, doesn't mean that those findings would be consistent or inferable to a different level. When you start to make that, in, that cross-level inference inappropriately, you get into the territory of the ecological fallacy. So these thing, concepts are very highly related, but ecological fallacy is specifically a type of bias, um, and it occurs when cross-level inferences are drawn from aggregated data. So if you use um, area-level findings to draw conclusions about disease ideology in individuals or any other form of cross-level inference, then you are introducing bias to your study and you're um, at risk of invoking the ecological fallacy. The modifiable aerial unit problem, I would say, is like not inherently bad. It's something that we always have to acknowledge and recognize, but it's just a reality of working with spatially aggregated data. Ecological fallacy is something that you can and should avoid. And so I would just urge you to be sort of careful and thoughtful when you're doing things like using crosswalks to aggregate across spatial levels, to always keep these things sort of in the back of your mind. Okay, so you've made it through the boring part of me talking at you, and the rest of the session is really gonna be us um, working through R together. I'm just gonna key up this first section of the crosswalk uh, exercise and then we will switch to R and work through it together. So let's take as our premise that we are interested in understanding the correspondence between two levels of geography. One, the forward sortation areas and two, the public health units. Forward sortation areas, as I already said, are spatial areas defined by the first three digits of the postal code they are census geography. So we have census data available at the FSA level. PHUs, or public health units, are not a census geography. We do not have census profiles at the PHU level, but we do, um, but they are, but they are larger than FSAs. So we can realistically think that we can aggregate FSA data into public health units. And the purpose of this crosswalk exercise is that we are going to use shape files that um, are in the folder that you've downloaded. You could have downloaded them yourself. They're freely available online from Statistics Canada and Ontario GeoHub respectively. Um, but I thought I would save you that step. And we're going to use the shape files to create a crosswalk for FSA to PHU correspondence. Something that I want to say is that if you're aggregating spatial data, oftentimes you want to start with the smallest geography possible. So like the question could come up of why aren't we making a DA to PHU geography? Because as I said before, DAs are the smallest geography that census profiles are released for. The reason we're not doing that is because the DA shape files are very large and very slow and I wanted to make the code somewhat efficient for this workshop, but that's certainly a task that you could undertake if you were if you were working to create a crosswalk like for your own um, non-census geography. Uh, Jeff is asking a question uh, of were PHUs designed with DAs or FSAs in mind? So no, they were not. The public health units are were designed, I think that what happened actually historically is that the public health units were defined locally. So a lot of the public health units are managed by, the munis by some municipality. So for example, the York Region Public Health was operating out of York Region and they sort of took responsibility for some geographic unit around them. At some point, all of the uh, public health unit boundaries across Ontario were harmonized uh, so that everybody had a responsible public health unit. So the, the province was essentially divided up into 36 public health units. They've since downscaled, I think, to 34. But they don't intentionally respect census boundaries. 
um, so the DA or FSA divisions. In a lot of cases, they do end up following those lines because the DAs themselves are designed to respect real world geographic boundaries. So like a major road is often used as a DA boundary. And so because both the PHUs and the DAs cho like choose independently to respect those same road networks, they do tend to line up, but they were not intentionally made to do that. And there are sort of many cases of um, disagreement, uh, especially where the boundary doesn't fall on a major road network. Great. Okay, so I'm going to switch to R. I think I said, I think right, I suggested that everybody be working in R Studio. I suspect that many of you are, but I, um, but I would uh, suggest that now is the time to open up your R Studio session. Can I just get a, a confirmation in the chat that you can see my R Studio screen now? Great. Yes, thanks. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and I would, and I will uh, tell you also to open. You don't need to have anything else open or loaded other than the R file that was in the um, working folder. Um, okay. So I just want to orient you, and this will help. Yes. Yeah, so Michael is asking if it's okay to work in normal R. Definitely, and that's why I sent the code as like a regular R code file. Um, it should work exactly the same, but let me know if you're having issues and I'll uh, try to troubleshoot as we go along. Uh, okay, so I just want to orient you to um, what's going on with this file and hopefully this will also be useful for you um, if you choose to sort of review the materials at a later date, but um, you are, as you know, participating in this crosswalks with census data using our workshop. The file is set up essentially so that it takes care of everything within it, the packages, the file loading, etc. And there is a limited amount of metadata or readme information about what the purpose of the workshop is, which is to create and apply a geographic crosswalk. So both sections, both exercise sections in one. The input is going to be two, the two shapefiles, the FSA shapefile and the PHU shapefile, and some census data. And the output is going to be a crosswalk file, which I'm currently outputting as a CSV, as well as a map, which I'm, I think is a PNG. Um, but it's meant to be relatively self-contained as long as you point the, your R session to the right folder. So the folder structure in the zip folder that you received is intentional. And um, if you change or rename the files, et cetera, et cetera, it might cause problems. So again, if you're having issues related to that, then, then me message in the chat, I'm happy to troubleshoot, but as a base, Please don't. Um, okay. So I think that we're just gonna um, get everyone set up, and then I'll and then I'll take a break because I know we've been going for about uh, fifty minutes now. But just to walk you through what this first section is going, this is just to load packages. If you've worked in R, you'll be very familiar with packages. The packages that we're using today are pretty common, I would say, in the like s spatial data management um, realm. Specifically, we're using Tidyverse and essentially es essentially the dplyr uh, functions to do our non-spatial data man management and manipulation. We're using the SF package to manage the shapefiles and do some data management and manipulation of spatial data. And then the other three are just for data visualization. So TMAP is a good option for pretty straightforward um, mapping, both interactive and static maps. And then units and grid are just um, a couple 
one-off packages that we need for specific functions, which I'll flag to you when we get to that point. I want to say, the one thing I want to say is that all the visualization we're doing in TMAP, you could have done in ggplot. I often use ggplot um, for making maps. And if you're already like an advanced R user, you're probably very familiar with ggplot syntax. So that might be um, more natural for you as a starting point. I'm using TMAP mostly because I thought it would be useful to introduce it um, to some of you that might not be familiar and also because of the, the capacity to do interactive maps, um, but that's a sort of personal preference, I would say. So if you run this first section of code, it's just going to check whether your system has installed the packages in, in this list of required packages. Um, create a variable called new packages that lists any that you need to install and then install them and load them. I don't, I have them all installed and I have them all loaded. So nothing is happening on my end, but something might be on your end. Okay, so let's load our shape files and then, um, and then we'll take a break. So the first, so all we're doing is just importing the files from our computer to R. So we're working in this crosswalk data um, data folder. And there's two files. The LFSA is the FSA shape file. And the second, the Ministry of Health Public Health Unit boundary is the PHU boundaries. Should be relatively self-explanatory. So the first thing you need to do is set your uh, working directory to the appropriate point. So if you run get working directory, it's going to tell you where you're currently um, working. And mine is, and you want this to map to wherever you've downloaded this crosswalk workshop folder and unzip. So if it's not, if you're not already in the right working directory, then update the set WD call to the appropriate file path so that wherever you've unzipped the file to is the end of the path. And let me know if anyone's having issues with that. Um, so then we're gonna just use this function stread, which is in the SF package to load the two shapefiles into our uh, workspace. So phusf is 34 observations because there's 34 public health units and we can um, just look at it. And you'll see that two things. So the first line of code where we load it in says it's going to read this layer from the data source using the driver Esri shapefile. That's because this shapefile, as with many shapefiles you'll download off the internet, was originally created in ArcGIS. And that we end up with a simple feature collection with 34 features and nine fields. So I guess I'll say many of you will be familiar with this, but simple features um, is the object class that R uses to handle spatial data. So um, PHUSF is a simple feature object representing the public health unit boundaries. There are 34 public health units. And you'll see that the last variable in the simple feature object is this geometry variable, which contains all of the parameters defining the geographic um, limits of each PHU unit. And we can also look at this using TMAP, so setting TMAP to view mode, which is interactive, and then using a simple TM shape and polygons call. And it'll load us an interactive map of Ontario's 34 PHUs. And so you can, you can scroll and zoom around with this. But for example, if I click on this one, I can see that that's Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit. This is all looking good. So let's load the FSAs. This is a bit of a bigger file. 
Um, because it's national, so the first thing that we want to do is use the dplyr pipe to filter to PRUID 35, which is only Ontario, because obviously the public health units are only for Ontario. And we also need to transform our CRS. Um, this is because of the, some, the intersect that we're going to run later, but essentially um, we, need to, we need these PHUSF and the FSASF to have the same CRS. And we're going to use the one that PHUSF already had, which is WGS84, using an ST transform call. So I'll run this code. And I'll also inspect the object after and then talk about it briefly. So you'll notice, first thing to notice is when you ran the uh, ST read call, we got a similar message to before reading layer LFSA from the source using driver Esri shapefile. We had originally 1,643 features, which is the number of FSAs in all of Canada. And we were also originally working with a projected CRS of Statistics Canada's Lambert uh, projection in NID 83, so, which was different than the one that the PHU has. This is also the Lambert projection is what all of the stats can shape files come with. So you'll have to do this kind of um, SC transform call pretty often when you're dealing with non-census geographies. But you'll see that after we run the rest of that, the filter and ST transform, then we end up with uh, 520 features. And it looks very similar to our PHU SF object. Um, we have FSA, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, a geometry variable in our SF object. And we can also map this, this, uh, oops, sorry. I was messing around with something earlier. So your code should read TM shape FSA SF. Um, but I'll, I'll load this plot. It takes a little bit longer because, um, because there's more FSAs and also because the geo, the geometry of the SFA, FSA boundaries is a little bit more complex, but it'll load, um, in a second. Is anyone who's ha who's working along having any issues getting to this point? Obviously, it's all fairly. Um, not like statistically complex or anything that we've done, but I know that some of you are newer or returning to R. Installing the packages is taking forever. OK, so maybe let's go. OK, so. I hopefully sorry to hear that installing the packages is taking forever. Um, Jeff, hopefully by the time we get through the break, you'll have a chance to run um, the rest of the code. It should take it should run fairly quickly. Yes, it is normal to have um, lots of codes running for installing the package. Um, yes, so Nick is getting an error. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'll come back to your error in one second, Nick, but I, but I see that Edward is having some issues with reading in the files. Um, and Priya seems to have suggested a, a fix. So uh, try that if it doesn't work, but I will say for this syntax. So yes, so when you copy like if I was to copy this file path, um, where is it? if I was to copy this file path to my R session in my set WD call, it would put one set of slashes, but R doesn't like one set of backslashes. R doesn't like the single backslash, and if I run this set WD, I'll get um, this error at the bottom, U used without hex 
digits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's because the backslash is an escape character. Um, so it's not reading it as a slash. So you need to either double up your, your backslashes to make two of them or switch them to forward slashes. So if I switched all of my, for, my backslashes to forward slashes, then this will run properly again. Um, and yeah, it might be a Windows Mac thing. So if you're on my, I'm on a Windows computer and I don't have a Mac um, with me today, but if you're on Mac and you're having issues, maybe try Priya's um, suggestion. And uh, thank you for, for helping that helping with that Priya. Yeah, so Jeff, the, exactly. The, using the double backslash does remove the need for switching to forward slashes. Um, I've found, in my experience, this works for every, every situation uh, in R. So I've started using it instead of switching the, the direction of the slashes because I find it to be faster for me. And then Nick is having a different issue, which is um, that when he tries to map it, he's getting an error of um, that there is invalid ge geometries, invalid polygons. That's fine. Um, it's an issue with, again, with the Esri shapefiles. We're going to fix it later in the code. So I would just ignore, like, I would just leave it for now because we'll talk about that very, very sh shortly. And yes, so same Michael. OK, so, so it sounds like Michael is having this issue, too. Um, I'm going to give you a break now. But I will say that the, one of the first things we will talk about when we come back is why the shapes are invalid for the FSA simple features object, and we will fix it. Um, so you can run this map after, and it will work. Um, but it has to do with Esri trickiness. Um, so I'm going to say let's come back at, it's 2.05 now, let's come back at 215. I will stay online and we can continue to troubleshoot in the chat, but if, if now is a good time for you to take a step away and uh, get a drink or bio break or whatever you need, then um, I'll see you at 215. Is anyone having any other issues? Um, okay, so Jessica. I'm not sure the RG Dal call you're using. I don't know, like, did you run the the ST read and this is like a nested? Sorry, can you say that again? Um this is the the error that you're getting is about shape F creating an object shape FSA, but that's not code from my, that's not my code. Oh, 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 I found. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, I think I was trying to create it. Okay, which line? So we're on line um, 85. 85, okay. I'm also a bit newer to R. Yes, Jeff, that's the error code that we'll re return to. As you say, if you want to, if you want to fix it now and um, and be able to see the pot while we're on the break, I think that um, somebody I can't remember who Nick. Uh, 
maybe had put a f a bit of code in the chat that will that will fix it, which is this tmap options, and I'll put it in the chat too. Thank you. I can talk about it in a bit of like detail now and then I'll, I'll repeat when we circle back to it after the break. But essentially what's happening with this um, invalid geometry situation is because the shape files were created in ArcGIS and loaded using the Azure driver into R. We're now working in a different GIS. We're working in R, specifically the um, SF package. So the GIS has changed and the different GISs store geometry differently. So, so they're like the order of points on the border, uh, for example, is stored differently in um, ArcGIS than it would be if you created the shapefile in R. And so what happens is the Azure driver, when we loaded the shapefile, tries to fix those, but it doesn't fix all of them successfully always on the first time. Um, and so we have essentially data management errors uh, that cause issues when you try to draw the FSAs, but it's essentially a trivial error because all, all of the information is valid. It's just stored a little bit differently. So running either the TMAP options code or what we're going to use, which is another uh, function called ST make valid, will fix it. And then you won't have issues moving forward. But it's a pretty common issue when you're working with them. Um, that can shape files in R because they think that everyone uses ArcGIS. No, you actually just run the tmap options as its own line of code and then rerun the tm shape. And then I guess the other thing I'll say for those of you that are still um, just hanging out is this is not like critical to the exercise, but for your interest is that you can already see that these are um, incompatible or like non nested geographies. Because like, for example, this is the, the FSA map, this one FSA POV um, covers basically all of Northern Ontario but that the Northern Ontario um, is actually split into three public health units. So we're gonna have to deal with that uh, later on. Yeah, uh, Jeff, you're totally right. The DAs up there are very weird. 
I mean, the problem is, and this is true, like when you do any thing in Ontario, the North um, shows up huge on the map. And so it's very visually alarming sometimes to see um, data inconsistencies, issues, incompatibilities, blah, blah, blah. But realistically, um, all of Northern Ontario is very sparsely populated and actually even the people that live in Northern Ontario are highly concentrated along the southern border or like the southern half. So even though this area can be um, very difficult to manage geographically, it's often you're, you're dealing with like at a population level, very few people. But of course, then there's like the equity issue of um, Northern Ontario is often sort of hand waved away in a lot of spatial analysis stuff uh, focused on Ontario and that causes its own problems with respect to sort of which subgroups of the population are being missed by these kind of spatial approaches. So. Um, yeah, so am I using, Jeff is asking, am I using SF as short for spatial file? It's actually short for simple features, which is the type of object that, um, I guess R loads a shapefile as, but it's also shapefile, spatial file. I just use it to, uh, like, as my habit, as a suffix on any spatial, any, any object I'm creating in R that carries spatial information. Um, Alec is asking about reading the map. Does it show the FSA? So, so sorry, I, I was, I had switched back to the PHU map while we're on a break. Um, but I'll just load the FSA map again. What do you mean by show the FSAs, Alec? Because I think, like, so this is a map of FSAs. And so each, each region is an FSA. And if I mouse over it, it'll show me. And if I click on it, it'll show me a little bit more detail um, about it. I'm not sure if that answers your question. The PHU shapefile is not visible. Yeah, exactly. So you could you could load them as on the same map as two layers on the same map, but I've just loaded them separately for now. Okay, and I think we should be back from break now, so I'll continue on. Great, thanks, Alec. Okay, so so we're gonna create our crosswalk, um, which involves um, which involves understanding the overlap or correspondence between our two sets of spatial boundaries, the FSAs and the PHUs. This is, if you're doing this in ArcGIS, if you're Googling how to do this, this is what's commonly known as a spatial intersection. So we're going to create a new spatial object or SF that has all of the different geometries across Ontario by FSA and by PHU. So we're gonna calculate the geometric intersection of our two sets. 
Um, we're going to do this using a function called st intersection. But before we actually run the st intersection, we need to do two validity checks. One, um, they need to have a matching Sierra. So I mentioned this when we were loading in the data, but they need to have a matching CRS and we can test that this is true of the two objects that we're, we've created, the FSASF and the PHUSF by using this STCRS function which retrieves the CRS of each object and then the double equals which is a logical test of whether it's equal, they're the same or not. And if you run that it'll say true which is just that they are matching CRS and we are good to go on that one requirement. The other requirement is that the geometry has to be valid for both SF objects, which we can test using another function from the SF package, st underscore is underscore valid. And if we run this and summarize the results in a table for the PHU SF, um, it's going to give us only one table entry, which is valid geometry. 34, so that means for all 34 PHU units, we have valid geometry. And then if we run it again for uh, FSA SF, the, this will take a little bit longer. Um, but we already know because of the errors that some people have been having when they started to, when they tried to map the FSA boundaries that we are going to have invalid um, geometries. And unfortunately, um, yes, it is normal and common that this code takes this long to run. The, in my experience, the doing sort of complex spatial operations in R on large geographies, so like Ontario is physically large, um, takes a lot of sort of computational power and can take quite a long time. I guess one thing that I'll talk about while this is running is why I think FSAs have become increasingly like relevant to me. Actually, I'm going to save that for the next time that my code is being slow to run. So teaser. Um, but okay, so the, the table has printed and you see that we have um, a certain number of valid geography or geometries, but then five ring self intersection errors. And I'm going to, and I suggest that you also run this next line of code, code 116, ST make valid while I talk about this, because it also takes a while. Um, basically, I talked about this briefly at the break, but essentially vertices, meaning the points that define the boundary of your geographic area, are stored differently in ArcGIS than they are in SF, the package we're using in R. There's a link in the code that we'll talk about it a little bit more. Because the vertices are stored in a different order, we get a ring self-intersection error, which just means that 
how R is parsing the order loops over itself. But that's because ArcGIS is not storing the points in the same order. I don't know if that totally makes sense, but essentially we need to run some code, this st make valid, which is going to fix the ordering of the of the vertices in our geometry variable and make it have issue. Uh, so Al is getting a different issue, which is um, edge has duplicate vertex, vertex of edge. Yeah, this is a also an Esri artifact. Basically what's happening is the points um, conflict. Like R doesn't like it when two edges overlap, but the ST make valid call should still resolve that issue for you. So ST make valid is just a, a function and Jessica is also having that issue. So ST make valid um, should, is essentially a function from SF that will resolve classic uh, GIS conversion errors. So if you run it, um, it should no longer be an issue. So yeah, so it's not, so you're still getting like essentially errors on the same polygon, but of a different class. And that can be because of the way that the SC is valid function runs, which is just, it's like checking for errors and maybe it's picking up the um, duplicate vertex error first before the, the ring self intersection. So it's labeling it as a different. Um, the reason that I put the reason equals T in this code was so that we could talk about it, but it actually like, as long as you're not concerned about the validity of your shape files, the reason is not super important. Like we know that they are valid. Um, and both of the reasons that we're talking about are just a function of sort of data management idiosyncrasies, but I wouldn't be necessarily very concerned from like a data validity uh, perspective. So I ran the S, the F, I, I ran the S, uh, sorry, ST make valid to fix my geometry and I saved it as a new object, FSA underscore SF underscore V, um, which if I open or summarize it, it's giving the same, um, exact same values as before. We still have 520 features, the, the CRS, et cetera, et cetera, is all unchanged. The only thing that's been changed is some of the parameters in the ge geometry field, if we were to dig into it. So now we're ready to run the PHU FSA intersect. So we're going to run this ST intersection um, function, which all it needs to know is the shape files, or sorry, spa spatial objects that you're interested in intersecting. So I'm going to run that. And it's going to warn me that um, we're assuming planar geometry. That's fine. And this one is going to take a while, so I'm going to talk about um, FSAs. So I used to ha I used to work with a lot of data that had um, full postal code. Full postal code is nice because um, other than like address information, it's often the most spatial resolution we get when we're working with let's say like secondary data data that are not collected explicitly to be um geographically attributed when you're working with fs or sorry when you're working with postal codes um as many of you are familiar postal codes are not um don't represent exclusive points in space and so you run, usually in Canada, you run a, f a file called Postal Code Conver Conversion File Plus or PCCF, which converts to all the census geographies. And we often 
will then use the smallest census geography of DAs as the starting point for any sort of crosswalk. So it ends up being a, a two-step process of one, convert the postal code to census geography using PCCF, and then use a crosswalk to convert your census geography, usually DA, to whatever geography, whatever other non-census geography you're interested in. Increasingly now, in my experience, postal code is obviously an identifying feature. Um, so for data privacy reasons, I've been getting a lot more de-identified data, which often has the last three digits of the postal code dropped off of it. So rather than the analyst who's like creating the data, converting the postal codes to DAs and, and then removing the postal code, because DAs are also de-identified, they'll just drop the, the last three digits and give me FSA. Frustrating because FSAs are larger, um, but easier for whoever the analyst is on the other side. So I've seen them coming up a lot more and especially um, with more data coming directly from hospitals who have more, I would say, lower analytic capacity than previously where all the data was coming from, more so from the ministry. Um, my code has finished, so um, we'll, we can circle back to this conversation later, but I'm interested also to hear some of your experiences in terms of the spatial data that you're getting. Yeah, exactly, exactly, Jeff. That is, it's a, it's essentially a, sh a shorthand term. Okay. Um, how's everyone else's intersect going? Did it, did it run for? Has it run, finished running for any of you yet? So I'll show you the output of mine, which is. Um, yeah, Michael, it's not totally uncommon for it to take 15 minutes or like longer. Um, I have a pretty fast computer and it's like slowish on mine. I did also put the RDS file, which is like just a saved version of the intersect file. So if you're getting sick of how slow your intersect is running and you want to just load the completed intersect, you can load it using line 129 of the code read RDS, um, load it directly into your workspace. But if, um, but if, uh, if it has run, what you'll see is this um, output, which is showing up now in my environment, and also because I'm inspecting it in my console, that I have a simple feature collection with 792 features and 14 fields. So you'll see that this is, um, obviously more than the number of FSAs, which was 520, and that's because some FSAs, in fact many, have been split across PHU boundaries. And so when you intersect it, it's, it creates a separate polygon for each of the components of the FSA. So this is the part of the SFA that belongs to York Region, this is the part of the FSA that belongs to Durham Region, etc. The reason that it has 14 fields is because it preserves the variables from both the PHU SF object and also the FSA SF object. So Alec is also not, not getting an output yet. This, okay, the, I, was, I was worried that something like this would happen. I think that this intersect can take a really, really, really long time to run. So I encourage you, if you're comfortable with it, to just load it from the folder. What I will say, if you don't want to do that and you want to, you're interested in seeing the um, SF, or sorry, you're interested in seeing the, the intersect function run on your computer, I would su suggest taking a subset of both the FSAs and the PHU. So maybe I'll circle back to this as an option at the next break. So, so I would say for something to, for you to work on, work through on your own. So I would say for now, 
if you're still, your intersect still hasn't run, please use line 129 of the code to load it from the file. But at the break, I'll go back and talk about how you can subset your SFA, sorry, FSA and PHU files to um, be smaller so that your intersect will run faster. And if you're a, an advanced R user and you're comfortable um, doing that yourself, then I'll just say, and I'll put this in the chat too, that if you limit to, if you limit your FSA file to code starting with L and M and you limit to PHUs of uh, 3895 I don't worry, I'm typing it. To those four PHUs, then you'll have sort of Toronto, Peel, York, and Durham regions. Um, and you can proceed with the exercise with either the subset. But again, no need to worry about that. Please just load the intersect file from the your folder. Um, and I'll talk about excluding at the next break. So I'm going to run this plot, which is just a plot of our new intersect, just so you can see what it looks like. Nick is getting an error. Um, you're getting the error on which on which line of code, Nick? And did you run the and you ran the um, hmm. Okay, so so I think so I think in this case, can you run the the Tmap options? again because I think basically probably my file has some geometry that your computer doesn't like. Are you on a Mac by any chance? Okay, bizarre. Sorry. I did try, I did like cross test this code on another computer, but I'm not, but I'm not obviously I'm not able to run it on everyone's computer. But I think my gut feeling is that if you run the Tmap options check and fix or or ST make valid, then it should resolve on the PHU FSA intersect file, it should resolve the issue. But maybe let me know if that's still not working for you. I tried ST make valid on the intersect and I got the same error again. I didn't get so the last part of the error. Oh no, yeah, I'm still getting um, intersect is invalid, and the spherical geometry error. Okay, thank you. Um, And I if you could have different versions because like I already had most of these packages installed. Yeah, it's possible. What? Let's look at the versions actually. And when you ran the Tmap options check and fix again, it didn't fix it. Yes. Yeah, I did. I reran the Tmap options check and fix equals true. And then I also tried ST make valid. And neither and neither worked. No. Okay. That is 
Very unfortunate. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so I think pro let's see the SF version specifically. I have 0 0.95. I have 1.0-1. 1. Okay, so it's possible I'm using an older version. And that's why your version doesn't like my polygons. Mm -hmm. I could try manually running the intersect instead of loading it from the RDS. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's what I would suggest just because like you're not having like you were able to essentially get valid geometry for both of the inputs yeah but the and the but then the output from my computer is invalid on your computer exactly so i think try to run it manually i'm sorry i i, I wish i had caught this issue before that's okay and i'll try and i'll only. try and troubleshoot like after but i just don't i don't want to like it's For just sure. hard to, to do on the fly. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Okay. So I think unfortunate. So I think I'm gonna, just going to keep going for now. And then if, and then I'll, I'll follow up with the people that are still having these issues um, at the next break and see if we can figure something out. So just looking at the uh, visually at the, the PHU FSA intersect um, option, we have, um, and I'm, I'll say that I switched to TMAP mode plot, which is a static map. We usually, previously, we were using TMAP mode view, which is an interactive map, um, because plot runs faster. But um, you'll see that this map has both sets of boundaries from previously. So this whole middle section is one PHU, but there's like a DA up here and a DA down here. And so we are essentially getting smaller geographies that respect both sets of boundaries, which is the point of the intersect. And it seems to have run successfully. Now the problem becomes for a crosswalk, we are interested in mapping the smaller units, the FSA is one to one to the larger units or PHUs. But as we've been talking about, there's issues where FSAs don't fall neatly into one PHU or another. And so we need to decide how to resolve those inconsistencies. So I'm just going to say for the purpose of this workshop that we're going to do it based on area. This is the, the simplest sort of deterministic way of, oh, amazing. Okay, so for those of you having the same issue that Nick was having, he had to run uh, SFU's S2, which is in the code. So please try that if you're still having the same issue. And thank you so much, Nick. Um, okay, so, so yeah, so how do we decide what the one-to-one -one relationship is going to be on what on what basis i'm saying for the purposes of this workshop the most crude way of doing it and by most crude i mean like simplest straightforward is to do based on area so what do i mean by that i mean that whatever the larger geographic portion of the fsa is in that's the phu that we're going to attribute the entire fsa to um, we can talk about some alternatives for how you would, how you would create a one-to-one -one crosswalk. It's always based on assumptions and you need to think about sort of carefully about what the appropriate assumptions are for your particular use case, but area is as reasonable as a starting point as we have for this, um, situation. So in order to do this, we need to calculate the area of all of the units in the PHU FSA intersect. We can do this by using a function from SF called ST underscore area, and we're going to use that function to create a new variable intersect area um, on our PHU FSA intersect object. 
that calculates the area. I'm going to open the table to look at this. One thing I just want to flag for you is sometimes a table will take a really long time to open because, yeah, so it's, um, so Jeff is asking what if there are pluralities, i.e. 40, 30, 30, still the largest area. Yes, that is what we're doing for the purposes of this workshop. I would say that's not necessarily best practices in all cases. It is quick and easy um, for today. But uh, I would say that your intuition that that is probably not always appropriate is, is very right. But for today, we're just, gonna, we're just going to take quick and dirty, whatever the largest one is, it, it, the whole, the whole um, FSA goes. So yeah, so when you're opening the table, sometimes it'll take a long time for a table to open when you're looking at a special spatial features, or spe sorry. <laughs> When you're looking at an SF object, that's because of the geometry. So you can always use the ST drop geometry function to remove it when you're trying to view the table and it'll load a lot faster. So I'm going to load the table and you'll see that this intersect area has been created for me. Um, it's in meters squared and um, it's also in scientific notation. So I want to know it in kilometers squared. This is obviously a trivial conversion because we can all do meters to kilometers very easily, but, but um, the units function is very useful if you need other units, so miles or miles squared or, or whatever the, where the conversion is a little bit more complex. So we're going to convert our meter squared to kilometers squared using the make units function. And we're also going to turn off scientific notation and we're going to view the table again and it's now in kilometers squared and without scientific notation. And you'll see um, to your point, Jeff, that in some cases the, fra the intersection is very dominated by one region. So this is KOC is split across these two intersect areas and one of them is 2,483 2, square kilometers and one of them is 0 0.002 square kilometers. So it's very clear that attributing all of KOC um, to this first peach is reasonable but much less reasonable in cases where um, that geometry is less, is more evenly split. And then all we have to do from here to create our crosswalk is some um, simple data management. So we're going to use functions from dplyr or tidyverse to do this. And we're going to create a PHU FSA crosswalk object by grouping PHU FSA intersect records by FSA ordering them or sorting them by descending area, so largest to smallest, and limiting our file to only the first row by group. So if I run these lines from 147 to 150, you'll notice that my PHU FSA crosswalk file is back to 520 observations. So that's one per FSA. And um, we're back to sort of one-to-one -one correspondence. Important to say that um, we've just discarded all the information about like what was going on in all the records that we deleted for the purposes of making a one-to-one -one match. So it is important to do sort of QA quality assurance on the full PHU FSA intersect files. We're kind of skipping that for the purposes of the workshop. It is at the end of this code section and I'll talk about it at the break. But I think just to, to flag for you that um, you can make a decision as we've made about how to choose the one-to-one -one correspondence, but you should probably also do your due dil diligence of looking at the full intersect file in a little bit more depth than we have the time to do today.
But for the purposes of, of us, let's just say that we like our crosswalk as it is, and I'm ready to convert it to a CSV that I'm going to share with my data provider so that they can give me the PHU information. I'm just going to uh, convert the PHU FSA crosswalk to data frame, keep only the variables that I need, and rename. So this is all just sort of cleaning up that table to create the file CW. And I'm going to write that CSV to my file so that it shows up in my output folder. And if I, op if I was to open it here in Excel, you'll see that what we're left with is a list of FSAs. This is every FSA in Ontario. And the PHU ID and name that the FSA belongs to or has been attributed to by this process. And so this file, then, this CSV file, could be used, as we'll use in part two, but also in sort of any analysis, not strictly a spatial analysis, um, that was interested in that correspondence. So I think a sensible place to take a break, I'm going to work through, I'll sort of talk through um, the QA, a couple of QA options in the break. I'll also take questions and then maybe we'll come back at 3.05. Uh, yeah, let's say 3.05 um, to wrap up the, this coding exercise and start, and start the next one. Any burning questions in the chat or from any of you while before uh, we, uh, yeah. So on line 155, you mentioned yeah. that we can remove uh, PHU FSA intersects. But when I did that, the very next couple of steps where you, we split the FSAs, that seems to break because we end up, we've removed that one, that one variable. Right. Yeah, sorry. I should have said I should have said more. I should have said more explicitly that like don't do don't remove it. Um <laughs> don't remove it if you want to do the QA stuff. Right. Uh the same thing with the uh FSA underscore SF. I followed that and removed it. And then there's a step with uh somewhere where we when we end up using that variable as well okay sorry about that yeah i think i i think i uh i think it was maybe bad oh here. yeah 190 yeah 190. yeah exactly okay yes so maybe if i give this workshop again i will not suggest that anyone remove anything from their environment yeah um i think i had like kind of done or, or actually originally the quality assurance stuff was before we exported the crosswalk, but then I thought like it would be too, it's too much of like a side piece. So I moved it to the end, but I think I didn't update the, you can delete this file now, which was obviously inappropriate. So thank you for flagging that for me and I'll update the code accordingly. Yep. And sorry, but, but I think for you just, just have to reload it. Yeah, I, I went through and I found out what it all broke and I just reran the code. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Michael. Sorry about that. So yeah, I thought that I thought that in terms of like, obviously, there's many options of of QA activities that you could do, and it would depend on what your concerns were, like what the assumptions were that you're in, most concerned about violating or like what you think, where you think the error was um, that, let's say like attribution errors would be most likely to arise from. Number one, I was just interested in knowing which FSAs are getting split, how many and like where. So I just used 
some dplyr functionality to, again, convert this original PHU FSA intersect file or object to a, um, a flat object and count the number of FSAs that show up more than once as a vector. And if you run that code, we see that we have 162. So of the 520, about like a third, a little bit less than a third, are actually split over multiple um, PHU. So obviously if you're making a crosswalk, ideally you want this number of units that are split to be as small as possible. So this is not amazing. This is not an amazing finding for us, but we can do a little bit more investigation around how much are they split? So this second chunk of code, lines 178 to 186, is about understanding the percent of area of each FSA that falls into each PHU that it matches to. So I'm basically using um, summarize functions from dplyr to do that calculation. And if you run that chunk of code and then open the table, you'll see that um, we now have a new variable. For each um, intersect row that shows the percent of the area of the original FSA that it represents. So for KOA, 52% of KOA falls into the public health unit that the whole, that all of FSA has been, all of KOA has been linked to in the crosswalk file, which is Ottawa Public Health. 50% is not amazing, but it's not awful. But what I would say is that 50% of the area doesn't mean 50% of the people. So one of the huge, huge caveats with using an area-driven attribution approach is that you're not accounting for population weighting. So this could be the 50% or 52% of KOA that nobody actually lives in and everyone actually lives in this 2% um, or 93 square kilometers. Those are things that you need to think about when you're creating a crosswalk file that's going to be used for attributing people based on geographic space. But actually, if we look through this um, per percent intercept variable, a majority of the FSAs that are being split are pretty dominated by one um, PHU. So KOG, about 96% is coming from one FSA, KOC, 99.99%. So as far as splitting in this situation, I'm not deeply, deeply concerned about many of them, but this is a case where you might want to go through and see if there are, for example, as Jeff pointed out, cases where like less than half of the geographic area of the FSA is falling in the PHU that it gets fully attributed to. And also well beyond the scope of this workshop, but something to flag for those of you that are familiar with PCCF Plus um, is that this kind of splitting is why we're sometimes interested in probabilistic attribution. So rather than saying 100% of the people of the FSA go in this PHU, you could algorithmically say, we're going to assign 95.5% of them to this PHU and 4.4% to a different PHU to try and um, limit measurement error and corresponding bias. But that's obviously a lot more complex um, and, and analytically involved. Okay, and then the other QA thing here is I wanted to look at a map of um, what the PHUs look like and then what the PHUs look like if they're defined by their constituent FSAs. So I'll show you what this means when the map loads. But... Um, I started, I made this new object called PHU from FSA SF, which is, let's take all the FSA boundaries, join them to the crosswalk, 
that we just made to make an FSA variable and then regroup all the FSAs together by page U to create like a Frankenstein PHU map that's defined only by FSA boundaries. Um, the plot will load in a second, but I guess I'll just say useful to you spatial analyst people. This other function, STUnion, um, is great for dissolving um, boundaries. And something that's nice about it is it nests nicely into standard dplyr syntax. So all we did here was like, you'll notice this code structure is very similar to um, when we summarized um, like area, but now we're using it to dissolve the geometry, which is a kind of cool little trick. And in, in this case, this is a case of using tmap to plot, make a plot with two layers. So I actually just added the PHUSF, the original boundaries, and the TM and the PHU from FSA SF as separate layers by adding two separate TM shape calls, but all connected by plus signs. I'm not sure if you're online right now, Nick, but did you have any other issues after you ran the SFUs S2 or was it resolved? Yeah, everything, everything's good now. Great. Great.
Okay, so now that my computer finally loaded this map, we can compare the boundaries of the PHU compared to the Franken PHU. And you'll see this on top is our Frankenstein one, so the the PHU, if they're drawn by FSA constituent geographies. If I toggle to the regular PHU map, it looks different, right? Like we see, so remember these two vertical borders, um, which are totally dissolved when we switch to the um, FSA driven boundaries. Unclear, so, so I guess point one is that the geographies do not look exactly the same. Unclear just from this map alone how important that is because something that I talked about a little bit earlier is that in these northern geographies, most of the population very sparsely populated in general, but the population that does live up there is highly concentrated in the south, where the boundaries do seem to be a little bit more preserved by our FSA geography. And then if we zoom in to sort of urban, the more urban or population dense parts of the province, the FSA boundaries versus the, P, the original PHU boundaries seem to map relatively well. There's definitely some weird fuzziness going around here. My interpretation of this crosswalk is that it's not amazing. There's probably a lot of misclassification or misattribution going on if you were to take only FSA data and use it to represent the PHUs. Um, part of that is because we're using FSAs, which, which are kind of quite large as a data management exercise. Like, remember I said at the beginning, I didn't want to use DAs because they um, are too compu computationally intensive. Um, so the FSAs are a way around that, but they're also less granular and their boundaries are a little bit shaggier. Um, so I'd say it's not, not a perfect crosswalk by any means, but it also seems to succeed generally at representing the the spatial pattern across the province, um, sort of working with the level of resolution that we started with, which was fairly low. And obviously there's many other sort of QA activities that you could undertake if you had specific concerns or um, use cases for your own crosswalk. Okay. So I'm going to switch back briefly to the, so I think we're back from the break now um, and into the home stretch. I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint briefly just to wrap up this um, part of the uh, exercise with a recap. So we are past part one, which is creating the crosswalk um, and we shouldn't have any shapefile issues moving forward. Um, but what we did in this step, in this process, was to import and manipulate our shape files, resolve some data issues. We calculated a spatial intersect. We, we reduced that spatial intersect to a one-to-one -one correspondence crosswalk, and we formatted and exported the crosswalk. And then we also did some QA activities in, in the break. Um, we, of course, had to make a lot of decisions along the ways, and I, in fact, made those decisions for you. 
Um, you may agree or disagree with the choices that I made. Specifically, we had to decide what spatial units were of interest to us. Um, we used FSA and PHU, of course, and we also had to decide on what criteria we would um, reduce our one-to-many correspondence from the intersect to a one-to-one -one correspondence in the crosswalk. We also had to decide things like um, how to label the variables in our crosswalk, what quality assurance checks were important to us, et cetera, et cetera. But let's take for granted that we think that our crosswalk is valid and sound. And we're going to go through the second step of this workshop, which is about applying it to summarize census data. So census data, as I've said a couple times, are published for the FSA level um, in Ontario. You all, or sorry, like na nationwide, um, you all are, have access to census profile data, um, either from StatCan website, a lot of universities have like a interface to do it in a little bit more point and click way. So U of T's is called CHAS, the, I don't even know what it stands for, but CHAS. There's also Odessi. There's a lot of different ways to download the census data. Um, but essentially, they are freely available online. I have downloaded the data for you, um, just selected a few variables that you may think are interesting or not interesting, but they will suffice for the purposes of today's exercise. And we're going to use those data along with the crosswalk that we created in part one to aggregate our census data to the public health unit level and then use TMAP to visualize the PHU level data. This is, I think, a little bit shorter and certainly computationally faster than the um, other section. So I actually think we'll probably end a little bit early. We'll see. OK. And I'm just going to clear my viewer so that we're good to go. Um, I wanted to start by saying that you can download census data directly in R. There's a package called CanCensus that does this very nicely. Um, and it essentially wraps around the Statistics Canada Web Data Service, which is like an API driven mechanism for downloading census data, census profile data directly. Um, two reasons I didn't take this route for the workshop. One, because you need a census map or API to use. You can get one for free. Um, and feel free to read the vignette for the CAN census package and pursue that if you're going to be working extensively with census data. But because you would have had to sign up in advance, I didn't think that, that was necessarily a rabbit hole we needed to go down. Um, and then the other reason is that, unfortunately, CAN census does not support querying of FSA level census profiles. So the geographies that they support are only the statistical areas, the dissemination area, the census tracts, census divisions, et cetera, et cetera. So it wouldn't have worked for this anyway, but I wanted to mention it anyway and include it in the code because I think it's like such a good resource that if you're working with census data, it's definitely worth exploring. But for your purposes, I downloaded the data in advance and I saved it in a CSV, which was included with the files. And we're going to go ahead um, on line 216 of the code and read the data into our R session. A couple things to flag. One is that the census data um, I downloaded is for all of Canada, so we need to limit to only Ontario. We can do this by restricting to FSAs that start with K, L, M, N, or P. That's because all of the postal codes in Ontario start with one of these letters. And we're also going to replace all the missing values with zero. Why are they missing in the original data? Because there is suppression in the census data. So you may be familiar, but census data is suppressed for 
sparsely populated um, DA or sorry, sparsely populated areas as well as areas um, that have opted out of the census. So this is particularly true of certain geographic areas that are wholly made up of First Nations reserves. Um, some First Nations choose not to participate in the Canadian census and their data will be suppressed from the census files, from the census geographies that represent that community. So it, it's, it is meaningful missingness, but I'm replacing it with zeros um, because to simplify our calculations later. Again, this is, we're essentially imputing with zeros, which may or may not be appropriate for your use case, but it's a simplifying assumption that we're making for the purposes of today. Another thing to flag, the census data, this is true of the file that you have, and also when it's loaded into R, has 521 FSAs. How is that possible? There are only 520 FSAs, as we just established extensively in part one. Well, we can look at this, inspect this in a little bit more detail by finding the set, the set difference between these two lists. So this function set diff just finds the difference between the set of FSAs captured by census data and the set of FSAs captured by our crosswalk. And if we run that code on two, line 222, it'll show us M7A. And then we're going to look at M7A in the census data by filtering our census data object to only that FSA. And we'll see that it's all suppressed. It has been suppressed, now been replaced with zeros. And five, which in, in um, census data parlance means fewer than five people, fewer than or five people live there. I will tell you that M7A is a set of postal codes that only map to Queens Park, the provincial legislature. It's not a neighborhood. Nobody lives there, but it does exist as like a mailing address. So it shows up in the census data, but not on a map. And we can ignore it for the purposes of this workshop, which we are going to do. And we're going to delete that row from our data. So now census data has 520 observations and six variables. Thanks Edward for coming, take care. Um, we can open up our census data and we have six variables, um, one of which is the FSA itself, one of which is the population for the 2021 census, one of which is the number of people living there that is are age 65 or older one of the limb denom is the number of people in the low. So, okay, limb stands for low income measure. Specifically, this is this last variable, the limb percent, is the percent of people living under the poverty line as defined by the low income measure after tax. And this percent breaks down to the number of people who are below that limb AT cutoff divided by the number of people that are not excluded from the income statistics. So you'll notice that the limb denom is a little bit different than the overall population. And again, that's because of exclusions, um, but it's important to know that if you try to like recalculate the limb from just this limb numerator divided by POP 2021, it would show up a little bit different which is why I retained the denominator in the file. So those are the variables that we're working with. We're gonna read in our crosswalk. You should already have it in your environment, but I'll read it again from the file. And then we're gonna use um, census, we're gonna use dplyr functionality to summarize our data at the PHU level. Something I guess I'll say is that this is all non-spatial like data analysis, essentially. Nothing we're doing 
in this whole section of the exercise involves working with spatially um, structured data, except for the shape, like for visualizing. But the actual data management is no different than if you were doing just normal data analysis of non-spatial data. So all this is just dplyr functions. So to walk you through it step by step of what's going on in this chunk of code from lines 235 to 243, we're going to take our census data. We're going to add the crosswalk information, joining the census data, which has, as you remember, FSA with the FSA with the crosswalk data, which has FSA. We're going to group by name and which is our the English name of the public health unit. And then we're going to define our summary statistics, which I've defined three for you. One is a new variable called LIM, which is the sum across all the, the constituent FSAs of the numerator of that LIM variable and divided by the sum of the denominator times 100, 100%. I also calculated the mean limb, which is just the mean of the limb percent variable, and then the same calculation of calculating the total, the total percent of the population across the PHU that is age 65 or older. If we run this chunk of code and we open the census data PHU to look at, a couple of things to flag for you. One is that this table is now set up there's 34 rows. Each one corresponds to the public health unit. So the FSA information has been totally um, sort of dropped because we've aggregated to the public health unit level. Two is that, remember, we calculated limb two ways. One was by summing the total of people that were below that low income measure cutoff divided by the number total number of people in the income statistics. And the other way was just by averaging the percent in each FSA um, across the FSAs that make up the PHU. These numbers are different. The reason that they're different is because this summary variable is essentially a weighted average because obviously the FSAs that contribute to the PHU are of different population sizes. And so when you take the numerator and denominator separately, you'll get a slightly different number than if you just average them, um, which a straight average assumes that each of the units contributes the same amount of information or has the same number of people. So something to just think about when you're thinking about how to aggregate numbers. And so we end up with two sort of usable variables. I really included this mean as just to illustrative point, but we have the low income measure percent and, and the percent age 65 and up. And I will say I chose these variables kind of arbitrarily, but, but, um, but the census data is very rich and has a lot of information um, that is useful for summarizing. So that was pretty easy. We now have PHU level estimates that again are based on the FSU level census data. Good for us. Now we wanna map it. To map it, the first thing we need to do is attach our um, census data at the PHU level to the PHU spatial simple features object. So the PHU boundary file, which was PHU SF. Um, and we're gonna do this using a left join by PHU name. This would be like the equivalent for those of you that are familiar with ArcGIS of doing a table join. And then the rest of this is a, is a oh, uh, so the code, so Jeff is asking about the code on line 237. Um, yeah, okay. So maybe let, maybe let me, yeah, this, this sort of, section right the left the summarizing i'm just going to walk through it a little bit slower so okay so 
what this chunk of code is doing is taking the census data, which remember our census data looks like this, it's FSA level, all these variables, but we have a numerator and a denominator. And we're gonna link in the public health unit information from the left join. So if I just ran it to there, I would get um, this, which is the FSA information from before, but attaching the public health unit information. This next line actually wouldn't change that output. Group by is a more of like a backend function in DeepLayer to tell you that you want it to do the next step, um, that, which is the summarize function by group. So by PHU. And so what this is saying is that by PHU, please calculate a new summary variable called lim, which is equal to the sum of all of the lim numerator counts across, like for the whole PHU, divided by the sum of all the denominator counts across the whole PHU times 100. So what you're essentially calculating is the total number of people below the low income measure cutoff in that whole PHU divided by the total number of people, people in the income statistics, so roughly the population for that PHU times 100, which is functionally a weighted average of the limb measures in each PHU. Or sorry, a weighted average of the limb measures in each FSA within the PHU. Hopefully that's helpful. So yeah, just to say that the rest of this is a we're visualizing it's going to be in TMAP, but it goes in a bit of a weird order because uh, of the, basically because of the order that TMAP needs to know the information. So maybe I'll just start by showing you the I'm going to run all of this. And then I'll show you the output and then we can talk through what each of the components of the code contributes to that. Actually, I'm going to stop that. Uh, I'm going to do, so just give me a minute to run this code and then don't worry, I'll circle back. Okay, so while that runs, Okay, so this is what the map is going to look like. It's essentially a map of the whole province of Ontario as our main map at the public health unit level, visualizing the percent of the population in each of the PHUs that lives below the low income measure after tax cutoff, a title, a legend, etc., plus an inset map which is like a zoomed in version of this dense part of Southern Ontario so that you can see it in more detail, plus an inset indicator that shows us what part of the larger map this inset map represents. Now, how do we achieve that in TMAP? So one thing is that TMAP, so we have to start by making the inset map. Um, one thing that TMAP uses as its sort of like syntax is um, 
bounding boxes. So bounding boxes define the level of zoom, essentially. Um, so the proportion of your the proportion of your like overall polygon object that is going to be represented visually on your map. So um, so the first thing we have to do is define the bounding box for our inset map. Um, and we're going to do this by taking the original bounding box object from our overall PHU map, which is going to create this bbox inset object. Um, and the bounding box is negative 95.2, 41.7, negative 70.4.3, and 56.9. And we're going to change those parameters to get the extent that we want for our inset map. So I did this just by, by iterating, essentially, essentially iterating like lines 256 to 276. So I just kept drawing the inset map over and over again until I liked the extent that it was mapping it at. And I wound up with these numbers. Um, so I'm gonna update that in the bbox in the inset object and convert it to a polygon, which is the type that R likes to see, or sorry, specifically that Tmap likes to see the bounding box as. So if that all sounds a little bit bewildering to you, don't worry about it too, too much. The core functionality of Tmap mapping is here, which is lines 267 to 274, where we're actually creating the map. And what we're gonna do is set the Tmap mode to plot. So remember, Tmap plot is static. Tmap view is interactive but we're going to set to plot and we're going to create an object map object called inset map that has the phu sf object visualized with the bounding box of bbox inset we're going to say i would like to visualize it with a choropleth map gradient color scheme defined by the variable LIM, which if you'll recall is our um, percent of people living below the low income measure cutoff. I'm gonna use the varietas palette and I'm going to say that I don't want a legend. The reason I don't want a legend for the inset map is because I'm gonna put the legend on our main map object. And TM borders is telling it that I want the, the boundary lines of the PHU to be drawn in dark gray. So I run that and I if I look at the sorry I think I just need to go back and rerun some of this code. So if I run the, uh, um, so Jeff, the four coordinates are not latitude, longitude. The bounding box is kind of convoluted, which is why I didn't like care to get into it, but it's essentially, um, So, okay, so if I just print the bbox inset object, it's the min, max, min and max for y and min and max for x of like defining a square. So the bounding box is a square defi divide, uh, defining like, so you, you only need the, latitude for x and the longitude for y, if 
that makes sense. But it depends also on like the projection and the CRS of your, yeah, exactly. You're drawing lines instead of de defining points. Yeah. So the, yeah. Um, okay. I actually have to go back and re reload my PHU shape file because what I did was I did the left join multiple times. And so if you're familiar with R, it'll, if you have duplicate variables, it'll start naming them like limb.x, limb.y. And so um, I just needed to, to do my left join a single time, but uh, now it should work. <laughs> what is happening? Oh, I didn't, of course, I didn't. Uh, I didn't summarize my census data. And now it's not taking the right bounding box, I think. So let me rerun re the bounding box and update the limits once again and map it again. Thanks everyone for your patience um, with my slow computer today. So this is our inset map, um, which is, let's just say appropriately zoomed to a region of South Central Ontario. So check one. The next thing we need to do is to make a main map, our main map, which is gonna be our overall file. For this, we also need to define a bounding box, um, but because we are interested in showing the whole extent of the province of Ontario, we can actually basically keep the parameters of the original bounding box, which is just the default, like if you use ArcGIS, the full extent, so it's going to show the whole province. But um, in our case, because we want to add a legend on the top of the file, we also need to add about, I'm saying 10% excess on the top of the page to accommodate the title. And how we do that is by changing VBox main 4, which is the Ymax value, to be 10% larger. 
Once again, we have to convert it to an SF polygon. And then this map, we've added a little, little bit more tmap syntax um, because this is where we're putting our legend and our title and so on. So just to walk you step by step through what's going on here, TM shape tells us the layer input data source, which is PHUSF and the bounding box, which is our B box main that we just made. TM fill is once again, it's gonna, this is gonna be the same as last time because we're mapping uh, the low income measure with the varietas palette. We're adding, however, a title, which is gonna be the title of our legend um, because we don't want the legend to say limb, that's not informative to the reader. We're gonna add percent below limb AT cutoff. The borders are the same, that's just we want dark gray boundaries. And then TM layout is where you add sort of your page option. So um, legend position is gonna tell it where the legend should be on the page. These coordinates is ranging between zero and one so where um, you're defining a point that corresponds to the bottom left of the legend object. So if you were to put it like one one meaning top right it would be outside the uh, page the legend title size is going to be point eight which is changing the font size of the legend title to be 80 percent of the default size title here is referring to the overall plot title which we're going to give it this name and title size is referring to the font size of the legend title or sorry the font size of the title text, which is going to be again 95% of the default size. Um, all those numbers you can sort of figure out by trial and error as you see fit. And then um, TM shape, VBOX inset is telling TMAP that we want another layer that is going to draw the inset bounding box. So the bounding box that we defined for the inset map on the main map and we're going to draw that with borders of line width one in black but no fill parameter because we didn't include tm fill or tm polygons or anything else so if we run our tm our main map code and we look at it then we should see essentially our full map of Ontario with everything except the inset map shown. which I think we've achieved. Um, so you'll see this is a, our map and handily, there's this nice blank square at the bottom left, which is where we're gonna put our inset map. So the third step in creating a map with an inset in TMAP is to define a viewport. Um, just to flag, this function is not from, the viewport function is not from TMAP, it's from another package called grid. Um, but essentially it defines a place on the, on the map, X and Y correspond to again, the bottom left point, and then the width and height of that object um, where it's going to place some other object that you're gonna define. And then we use the viewport. So if I run that code, then we use the viewport object or VP in our final call which is a function called tmap save, which is going to export this to, um, yes, we loaded, we loaded. So Jeff is asking if we loaded grid already. Yes, we loaded it already. It's, um, but I was just flagging because sometimes if you're just working in tmap, you might get an error um, 
like if you copy this code to a different project you're working on and you're thinking you're only working in TMAP, you might get an error um, that there's no viewport function and that's because it's in grid. But in this code, like the workshop code, it's already been loaded. Um, and then, yeah, just to say that to my knowledge, one of you might know better than me, but from what I can have been able to figure out, you can't actually print the map with an inset map in R, but you can save it outside of R. So that's why we're using tmap save to create a PNG file with our map. And then the tmap save just wants to know, what is your main map? Uh, yes, I can type. So tmap wants to know, tmap save wants to know, um, what is your main map object? Where do you want to save this file? What is the resolution that you would like in dots per inch? If you have insets, which we do called inset map, then it needs to know the inset and also the viewport. So all of these objects we've already created. And if we run this file, we end up in our um, workshop folder, output folder, it's going to create this PNG for us. So that's the end of this part of the code exercise. I have probably like five minutes of wrap up, but any, uh, any questions while we're still in R? Yeah, so if you just wanted, to, like, if you don't, if you're only, sorry, if you're making a map and you want to use just the data visualization code, you can use just that part of the code. You need tmap and grid packages. So I'll write that in the um, chat. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let me let me switch back to PowerPoint. So just to recap briefly on this part of the code, what did we do? We imported our, our census data and joined it to our crosswalk. We aggregated it using the dplyr functions, and then we visualized using the tmap functions. We had to make some more decisions. Again, decisions that I made for you. Um, we had to decide what variables we were interested in from the census, how we wanted to summarize them at the aggregate level, and how we wanted to visualize all the choices for the TMAP um, creation. And those are all sort of decision points that you'll have to, to, to you would want to consider making differently, I guess, depending on what you're specifically working on. So, um, I don't have a lot of wrap up thoughts, but I did want to just say that, as I've kind of alluded to, um, making a crosswalk can be crude, especially that flattening of, of one to many correspondence to one to one, but it can be very necessary for dealing with diverse spatial data. And just to say that there are a lot of sort of more complex approaches to this same problem of harmonizing data across spatial scales that we didn't talk about it's beyond the scope of this workshop but if this is something that is like core to your work you might want to explore further and happy to chat you know offline if you want to follow up with me on email on those things but so some some other things that come up commonly in my work are summarizing raster data which are continuous um, but and carry a certain spatial resolution with vector geometry. As I mentioned, using population weighted or probabilistic approaches to get a better attribution of one geographic unit population to another. 
and then also um, dealing with spatial data that correspond to different time scales. So all of these boundaries, like the ones that we're using today were from 2021, but they've changed quite a lot historically. And so thinking about those historical relationships in relationship in relation to present day uh, geographies can also introduce a lot of complexity and, and more choices that um, sort of fall onto you as the spatial analyst to make. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stick around for the next 15 minutes or so, but please don't hesitate to get in touch with me after the workshop as you start to use this in your practice or, or just with any other sort of interests. Um, and yeah, thanks, thanks again uh, for being here and for your participation. And I hope it was useful for you. And, and um, yeah, stay in touch with GeoHealth Network, because I think that Ray has, has a lot of other exciting opportunities coming down the pike as well. Um, if no one has any questions, I actually um, know an easier way, Emma, for um, finding the bounding box for TMAP. Really? Yeah, okay, so please. <laughs> it's called um, TMAP Tools, and it has a function that's just BB. Okay. Um, let me send you the code. Yeah, I think I, I think, yeah, okay. Because I, I've done that before, and it's super frustrating. So if you run this um cx and cy are the center x and center y coordinates and i get those just from google maps and then ext is your zoom level which you can just play with that and see how zoomed in or zoomed out you want the box to be um Amazing. and the output of this just gives you those four coordinates of the corners but also within the call to tm underscore shape you can do the same thing and just do it like right within the call Amazing. Thank you so much. I will definitely use that. I, I like full disclosure. I rarely use TMAP. I'm, I'm very like ggplot forward, I would say, but I have been transitioning a little bit because of interest in interactive maps and stuff. So it's definitely like newer in my skill set. So I appreciate the tip. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I think people are logging off and if no one else has uh, any sort of burning questions, I'll wrap it up here. Um, but just thanks again for giving your Friday afternoon to this workshop and, and I, hope, uh, I hope to see you, some of you again in the future at another one of these sessions. Um, and yes, so the recording, it is recording. I think it'll end up being posted on the GeoHealth Network website. I believe that Ray will follow up with you directly about that, but it's definitely recorded. We're going to do our best to make it publicly available. And so you can also share with other people. Um, it might just take a few days for that process to, you know, happen, like the download upload um, pipeline, but definitely the goal with all of this stuff is to make it freely available. And, and we will get in touch with you about how you specifically can gain access in the future. Thanks, Candace. Have a good weekend. Okay, bye everyone.